how is it that we're in the last installment of our cultural editions of the New Netherlands series? And only now we're deciding to focus directly on the subject of religion. By comparison, if you look at the New England colonies at this time, religion is the first thing you would talk about. You have to understand the, the plight of the separatists or the mentality of a Puritan who came slightly after the separatists. You would hear about their religious plight and you would see entire communities move from some part of England, usually in the southeast, and nearly transport all of it over into colonial Massachusetts, let's say. And one of the first buildings they would make would be the church and the community would be based around that church and how these settlers had a fundamentalist view of the world. Their religion was infused with everything they did. Every interaction, every relationship they had, every position they held, every job they undertook, and every time they looked at the outside world, they would interpret everything through their religion. A fundamentalist outlook. But in the Netherlands at this time, and in New Netherland, we see the beginnings of a secular outlook on the world the slow movement of your religious life into your private life and not in your public life. Remember, the Netherlands stood on the periphery of all these religious wars in Europe between Protestantism and Catholicism. Often dragged into those wars, but often the source of refuge for tons of people fleeing these wars. And whether they were Catholic or Protestant or even Jewish, as we're going to find out in this episode, these people were sick of a fundamentalist view. They were tired and worn down after several generations of these wars. They were worn out on the idea that your religious life should infuse everything you do. Determine who your friends are, who your enemies are, who you trade with, who you don't trade with. And so the Netherlands is one of the first places in Western Europe where religion was just pushed aside a little bit. This doesn't mean that there was a growth in atheism or even the idea of agnosticism, merely the compartmentalizing of a person's life and putting religion in one of those compartments and not every single one. That being said, this season going through the sources, I've seen references to shipwrecks where people will write down, you know what, it's good that that guy died in a shipwreck. God planned that. God did that. That was God's vengeance. So in a heated arguments or times of high emotion, God very much came into play in the Dutch mind. But in the minutia of life, God just rests lightly upon it. Not every single thing would be some sort of sign of divine pleasure or displeasure. And if it were, and you honestly believed that, you don't see the, uh, the, the mentality of New Englanders, where they're constantly worrying about what these things might mean for their destiny. Even if the Dutch at the time believed that, yes, God planned everything, everything happened because of God, we have a, a watchmaker God, they weren't busy trying to pick and part every little thing to determine whether that meant uh, God had given his grace onto me or not. Meanwhile, in New England, you'll find references to the, the plagues happening among the Native Americans, and there'll be New Englanders who see this as a sign from God that this land was meant to be conquered by the English or inhabited by the English. Again, you'll see whole communities, for their religious reasons, get up and leave England and show up in the New World, in New England especially. The Southern colonies at this time, believe it or not, not nearly as religious. They would have their religious revivals later on, creating the landscape that we're familiar with today. Furthermore, in New England, you see witch hunts, hundreds of witch hunts over decades. And it's not just in Salem. Go ahead and look it up. There are more witch hunts outside of Salem than inside of Salem brutal affairs where the, the testimony of ghosts and spirits were allowed into courtroom proceedings, where women and men would be put through these trials that would most likely kill them. And if it killed them, it often proved that they were innocent and not witches. And if they lived, it would demonstrate that they were witches and then they would be killed. To my knowledge, there is not one documented witch hunt or witch execution in the history of New Netherland. Existing at the same time, very close in proximity, and the two cultures of similar origins, and yet no witch hunts. That word witch was thrown around quite a bit. You can find that in the court records. 
often the court would be questioning why a man would be calling a woman a witch, not whether or not the woman actually was a witch. In New Netherland, being called a witch was an insult, not a death sentence. All right, let's get into it. So in the charter for the Dutch West India Company, there is no mention of religion. It doesn't really play into it. And this is unusual for the time. One of the major ways to justify the colonization of the world by Western Europe at this time was to put into these charters or into these missions, into these expeditions, into these conquering of entire peoples, the mission to convert the natives. You must convert the natives. And by turning them towards Jesus and God, you are justifying the brutal takeover of everything they had known. And even in places where they weren't trying to brutally take over areas like New France, they still had a mission in there, a mission to convert, bring those people to God. But the Dutch West India Company, not the case. This was a business, and the business of business, in this case, is business. Welcome to the Netherlands, while it's entering its golden age. There is no modern equivalent for what it was like there, as far as commerce was concerned. But the closest thing we have in a, in a, in a modern vernacular is hypercapitalism. The Dutch Golden Age is when everything went pedal to the metal. This small country of 1.2 million people would start a trading empire all over the world and would be the Amazon Prime of Europe. Especially in the city of Amsterdam, we see the first stock companies. We see the first stock exchange. We see the first venture capitalists. There's massive social mobility. There are a, a large immigrant population coming in from all parts of Europe and they can make it in Amsterdam. They can build their way up. What can you do is what was important, not who your father was. And in all this hubbub and excitement and because of the previous century of war, when those boats left to go to the new world from the Netherlands, religion just wasn't one of their priorities. In the first decade of New Netherland, after Henry Hudson's voyage, you see private Dutch traders. There are no religious figures whatsoever from the Netherlands who are showing up to convert natives or tend to the European Christians who are there. It doesn't exist. In fact, after the company started importing people to the colony, uh, these Walloons who themselves would be escaping Spanish Netherlands to practice their Protestant religion with some level of peace. Uh, even with this religiously driven group being sent over as the first wave of true immigration to New Netherlands, they didn't bring over a minister. In fact, it wouldn't be until the year 1628 that a Dutch Reformed minister by the name of Michaelius would be sent to New Netherland to service the population. And a year after that, in 1629, after much lobbying by the Dutch Reformed Church back in the Netherlands, the Dutch Reformed Church was made the official state church of New Netherland. Compare this to the charters of pretty much any English colony, where the Anglican Church would be grandfathered into the founding documents before settlers even step foot on the land. The same with the Catholic Church in New France. Before Jonas Michaelius showed up, the colony only had a comforter of the sick. This would be a lay person who would have some basic training in the ins and outs of church and how to perform a basic service. Right from the beginning in these basic services, the Dutch and the Walloon would worship together. It didn't matter that there was a language difference. They were both members of this reform tradition, Calvinist tradition. And so despite the language barrier and maybe some cultural differences, they recognized the unity of their beliefs. This will be very important for the entire history of New Netherland. And there is some consistency with it. When a new group of people come in, no matter how different they are, if they have a Calvinist religion, they are allowed a certain amount of freedom that these other groups, as you will see, are not allowed. So keep your ear peeled for the patterns that are about to emerge. Right from the get-go, the community was expected to provide some sort of living to their clergy, with a very small amount of that living coming from the Dutch West India Company itself. And if you had a patroon ship like Killian Van Rensselaer, you were responsible for providing for your clergy your own self. The company wasn't going to provide diddly squat for you. This lack of integration of church and state was also what was going on in the Netherlands. 
Compare this to France at the time, and then New France, where the Catholic Church was a wing of the government. And at times, it was the government, depending on the strength or the weakness of the monarch in charge. All official meetings within the colony would be opened with prayer, so there was that integration there and that common religious activity outside of the religious sphere. And any ministers in the colony, or the lower comforters of the sick, which are sometimes also the school teachers at this time, had to be approved by the religious authorities of the Dutch Reformed Church back in the Netherlands. And then they also had to be approved by the Dutch West India Company, later on just the Amsterdam Chamber. So there is some overlap where you have church and state both dealing with the same matter. But overall, we see the beginning again of secularization of these two things pulling apart from one, each, from one another, honestly, for the mutual benefit of both. I mean, would you today want a church running the state or vice versa? Would you like a state running your church? You can like one or the other, but there are a few people out there today who would like both. And probably a large majority who would like neither. Jonas Michaelius, being the first minister who showed up, but not the last with this attitude, felt that as a minister, he should have some leading role in the affairs of the colony. Much as you will see with the priests and the Jesuits up in New France. And back in the Netherlands, the Dutch Reformed Church was trying to get a leading role in the affairs of the state. They continuously wanted to have a Catholic Church-like influence at least for the time in question, and they never quite got it. And the same thing with the ministers in New Netherland. They would show up with this attitude like, well, you know, I am a minister here. I am the religious authority. I'm basically going to help run this place. I'm kind of an important dude. Only to find all the advice that they give, all the counsel that they were required to give to the director general, often went and fell on faint ears. And often there was a lot of friction between the religious leaders of the colony and the actual leaders of the colony. Michaelius actually referred to Peter Minuet, a guy who features prominently in this podcast as a, as a good and competent guy, as dishonest and wicked. And similarly, we see that some of the directors of the colony, they look at these religious leaders constantly nagging, whispering in their ear uh, as, as a real nuisance. And these religious leaders, they have authorities back in the Netherlands that are different than the governor's authorities or the director general's authorities. And so in this colony... The ministers were the one group of people who the director general didn't have complete authority over. Although they lived in close proximity, they're all in the same colony, they have different bosses, and they have different roles that do not exactly overlap. And so if you're an office fan out there, you're going to understand this reference. If the director generals are Michael Scott, the ministers are very often Toby Flenderson's. If you don't know the office, Toby Flenderson is the HR guy. And so although he, he works in the office, his boss is somewhere else. He works in the building, but the boss of the building, Michael Scott, is not his boss. And often Toby Flenderson will be the reason a lot of Michael Scott's insanity is shut down. Even when Michael Scott leaves and Steve Carell's off the show, Ed Helms takes over as the boss and his character of Andy Bernard. And like a year after he becomes boss, he says to Toby Flenderson, something to the effect of, now I know why Michael hated you. And so back in our colony of New Netherland, there is one group of people you, that the director general officially didn't have power over. One group where if they decided to go over the director general's head back to the Amsterdam chamber, they would certainly always listen to them. It was these ministers, these Dutch reform ministers. And the lack of appreciation or respect for the official religion of the colony was not just a habit of the director generals, up to Stuyvesant, who we'll get to, because he was very religious. Also on the patroonships, the most successful being uh, Killian Van Rensselaer's patroonship, Rensselaerwick. In 1637, Van Ren orders that a church should be built on the patroonship. Well, the patroonship minister shows up in 1642 by the last name of Megapolensis, who we're going to talk about a lot. And the church still isn't built. It's been five years. The people just couldn't be bothered with it. And Mega Palensis, he was bothered by this. And he saw the entire colony as going to hell in a handbasket, quite literally. Here's a quote from him. The inhabitants of this country are of two kinds. First Christians, at least so-called. Second Indians of the Christians, I shall say nothing. He, of course, would be the minister of the private patroonship at the top of New Netherland, 
right at the uh, area where New Netherland ends, and the Mohawk tribe has their part inside of the Haudenosaunee Confederacy. So he would be seeing a lot of these exchanges, let's say. And if you go back to our episode on the Esopus Wars in Schenectady, you can see what those exchanges entailed off in the woods of what is now Schenectady, New York. And even after Megapolensis has completed his tour of duty, so to speak, in the colony of New Netherland, and he's out of the picture, Rensselaerwick hires as a new minister for them a guy by the name of William Grossmere, or Grossmer. I can't read my own handwriting. They hired this guy. He's an alcoholic, first of all. He abandoned his wife. He actually was in the ministry, and he was deposed at one point back in the Netherlands. But using false papers and false recommendations, he successfully got himself the job of minister of Rensselaerwick. That's the type of vetting process they undertook when hiring ministers uh, for the private patroonships. In the 1640 charter, meant to stimulate more immigration to the entirety of the colony, people were granted freedom of conscience when it comes to religion. Specifically what this meant is from that point forward, you have the right to believe whatever you wanted, as long as it stayed in your head or stayed in your household. Officially, the only publicly worshipped religion that you could see in a town with a building or a public service or a celebration of some sort would be the reform religion. But the colony of New Netherland made it clear that as long as your thoughts stayed in your head or in your family, you're not out trying to convert people, you're not publicly displaying your religion, you could believe anything you wanted. And so throughout the 1640s, you see a slow trickle of religious minorities into the colony, barely noticeable at this time. Later on, it'll be extremely noticeable. You'll see Puritans from New England who are of the reform religion, so they, they would be fine. Uh, various other types of Calvinists also. But then you started to see Lutherans, who are Protestant, but they're not Calvinist. They followed Martin Luther, not John Calvin. You'll see Mennonites later on. You'll see Quakers. And you'll see Jewish people show up in the colony. While this is happening, the director generals, by and large, are not terribly religious. Some of them show a religious face to the public. But... In their alone time, they're mostly miserable drunks looking to make money for themselves. Willem Kieft being a perfect example. Uh, Van Twiller also perfect example of what I just said. Uh, under Willem Kieft, there was no laws about the Sabbath on Manhattan Island or anywhere else. So you could drink and party and do anything you could do any other day of the week. There were no uh, restrictions on the day of rest and worship, as you would see later. Even today, we have what's called blue laws. So on Sunday night, you might find it difficult in where you live to buy alcohol, let's say. Well, that's because of the legacy of these blue laws, which are still in effect. Keeft is known to have ordered the rebuilding, uh, the repair of one church. But in general, all the structures in New Netherland kind of wasted away under his rule, including the church structures. And Bogardus, a man by the name of Bogardus, who was the minister in the colony at the time, just hated him. And they, again, went back and forth as adversaries. And he wrote letters back home saying how bad Kieft was. And the two of them ended up being on the same boat, heading back to the Netherlands after Kieft was fired. And both of them died on the rocks outside of England in a terrible shipwreck, taking their bitter rivalry to the bottom of the ocean and into the afterlife. Now, before we get to Peter Stuyvesant, because that's most of our story, let's face it, let's talk about natives. So would these ministers who were once in the colony want to convert these natives? Well, officially, the West India Company had no mission to convert the natives of the areas they showed up in. But the Dutch Reformed Church wanted the ministers to at least feel it out. See if you could convert them. See if you can save their souls. Jonas Michaelius, in his dealings with the Native Americans, would develop this opinion about them. Savage and wild, proficient in all wickedness and godlessness, thievish, treacherous, inhuman in their cruelty, serving no one but the devil. Michaelius had little to no interest in converting the natives. The later Megapolensis uh, tried more to convert the natives, or, or at least have some sort of open relationship with them about religion. He tried to convert one native, and he gave as a gift to that native, who seemed to be on the, a promising course to uh, becoming baptized and becoming a proper Christian, he gave him a Bible. The native then sold that Bible for brandy and ran off. Other natives would see him preaching to Christians 
and telling them things like, don't steal, don't murder, don't do any of these things that we would consider sins. Or, re or reiterating what the commandments were of the Old Testament. The natives, instead of being impressed by the morality of the preacher, instead said, why do you have to tell uh, your people not to do these things? Shouldn't they just know not to do them? Why do Christians do so many bad things? Megapolensis was impressed by this reasoning. And in fact, he himself noticed that among the Iroquois in their own setting, in their own villages, they seem to have half the crime of the Europeans in their settlements. And that is the extent of the back and forth between the religious realms of the Dutch and the Native Americans. The Haudenosaunee, however, were in constant conflicts with New France, especially the Mohawks. And so Catholic priests and Catholic uh, Jesuit missionaries were sometimes dragged into the fray of all this, and the Dutch, being on the outside of it, often uh, received word of Jesuit missionaries being held captive by the Mohawk or the Oneida or the Seneca. And in times of peace, the Haudenosaunee would have chances to trade up in New France and play the Dutch and French off each other for lower prices. The Catholic priests up in New France, they would question these Haudenosaunee members because they didn't trade with them often. They didn't know much about them. The uh, missionaries were well into Heronia and a couple other little places, but the Iroquois Confederacy uh, was a hard barrier to break through as far as the missionaries were concerned. And during our time period we're talking about, they only just began to sniff around the edges of this uh, confederacy. At one point, a Catholic priest asked a, a young Mohawk about whether or not the Dutch, had the Dutch uh, given you the water of life? Have you been baptized? Have you experienced the water that will give you eternal happiness, eternal freedom, eternal forgiveness? And the young brave responds, Oh, yeah, you're talking about alcohol, right? Yeah, the Dutch give us alcohol all the time. It's amazing. I drink it and I get drunk. I feel amazing. I feel all the feelings that you brought up. Yeah, yeah, alcohol. Yeah, we get tons of that. And these Catholic priests were mortified that not only had they not been baptized or at least introduced to some rudimentary form of the Christian religion, they had also uh, apparently received large amounts of alcohol in trade for furs. And so while other Iroquoian people like the Huron are being converted, the Iroquois in the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, the Iroquois Confederacy, the Five Nations, whatever you want to call them, they staved off conversion for a very long time. And in fact, because whenever Jesuit missionaries would make their way in, usually plagues would end up breaking out. And cause and effect, the missionaries come in, and the plagues break out, the missionaries are causing the plagues. Now we know about germ theory, and we know how all that works. But back then, the Europeans and the natives didn't know about that. And so they just knew, cause and effect, missionaries show up, people start dying. And so they would take the hand gestures and the symbols that the Jesuits and the other missionaries would bring in as the symbols that caused the plagues. They would think that these European medicine men were, were casting spells upon them. And so there are records of inside of the Iroquois Confederacy, missionaries being killed for making the sign of a cross over a child because the natives would interpret that symbol being put onto the child as a death sentence, a curse of death. Part of the diplomatic relations between France and the Netherlands, where they had large chunks of time of complete peace with one another, were, you know what? If a missionary ends up in the hands of angry natives, maybe if the Dutch have an opportunity, we can go get that Catholic priest back, usually a Jesuit. And so if a Jesuit was captured by the Mohawk, let's say, they would hear rumors of all the tortures being done to his body, all the indignities. And there would be a, a commonality in that, okay, you're Catholic. I'm a, I'm a reformed Calvinist. Back in Europe, we're worlds apart. But here, out on the frontier, when staring into the face of these animus natives, w there's a commonality. There is a weak brotherhood, so to speak. And the irreligious Dutch always tried to ransom these Jesuits out of the hands of their ally Iroquois. And in some of these situations, the Dutch were actually willing to put their relationship with the Haudenosaunee at risk to get these missionaries back. Such was the case as with Isaac Jogues, who we brought up in several previous episodes and will be the star of a future episode when we get to New France. Isaac Jogues was tortured by the Mohawk, had the extremities of his face cut off, his nose and his ears, 
and his fingers were even bitten off to the bone. And it was actually Arndt Van Curler, who we've talked about before, who tried to ransom him several times from the Mohawk, but they wouldn't give him up, probably trying to use him as a pawn to get a good favor out of New France. However, on one occasion, Jogues accompanied the Mohawk to the trading post of Fort Orange. And while there, Van Curler and others were able to sneak Jogues away, kidnap him basically back into freedom. And when Jogues was brought to New Amsterdam, they held a huge celebration for this Jesuit Catholic priest, which is astonishing considering there was no open Catholicism in the colony. A huge celebration, music playing, cannons firing off. Stuyvesant himself, a staunch Calvinist, greeted Jogues as if he was a foreign minister or foreign ambassador, which in some ways he was. Finally, he was allowed to stay in the city for some time until they could arrange transport back to France. And while he stayed there, he stayed in a nice house full of all sorts of Catholic statues that they had found or that the Catholics, who have to worship privately on the island, donated. Now, maybe this isn't an example of, of how tolerant the colony of New Netherland was or the island of Manhattan. Maybe this is an example of diplomacy because, again, he is representing France in the New World and he should be treated with the respect that France deserves, a monster of a country at this time, many times the size of the Netherlands in population. Or again, maybe there was the common Christian element, considering you're in this new world full of strange people with strange religions, any sort of Christian religion has far more in common than the animist beliefs of any Native American group. And so you have this injured, mutilated, Jesuit priest coming to your island and he has the the scars of a martyr and in fact he's going to be considered a living martyr by the Catholic Church once he makes it back to France and even these Calvinists and the few Catholics there and the, the few Lutherans there and other groups even they can tell that this man has already bore the marks of Christ he has already been tortured in life he has already faced his crucifixion and so they treated him like a martyr despite the sect of his Christianity. Let's compare this now to some of the people in New England. Anne Hutchinson and her followers, they escaped the rigidity of the New England colonies and settled on Long Island. Her beliefs being like 1% different than everyone else's. And when she was massacred by natives, some of the folks in New England said this was justice. This was God's will. She should have died because she was a heretic. Now here we are in New Netherland, and we have Calvinists calling a Catholic missionary a living martyr. This is a level of tolerance that we only see elsewhere in New Sweden. We won't see this in New France. We won't see this in New England. And many authors have argued that this is the nugget, the seed, the little germ that will start the growth of tolerance in what will be the Western world. It will be this attitude uh, emanating out from the Netherlands and New Netherland. Nevertheless, there is always the fear of a Catholic plot or a Catholic takeover, or maybe the Catholics up in New France were going to come down or come around with a force and take over New Netherland. There was always that fear that the Pope would have some plan that would lead to their ultimate demise. So as much as they were tolerant of individuals, overall, the battle lines were drawn still. And I think tolerance as we know it today is something we project onto these histories. And we go, oh, look, there's a little bit of it there. There's a little bit of, there, of it there. But in reality, it's not quite as formed as we would look at it today. If tolerance is like a big old loaf of bread, right? This is, this is, just, this is just the first little handful of flour. We're not even adding in the yeast yet. Not even adding in a dash of salt. No water. Just a little, little tiny bit. We don't even know what it's going to be yet. Since I brought up Peter Stuyvesant, let's talk about him for a little bit. Before Peter Stuyvesant came along, the colony was very unmotivated by the religious authorities and didn't often observe the level of morality overall that the ministers would have liked to have seen in a group of colonists who are supposed to represent the Netherlands and the Dutch Reformed Church as a whole. Stuyvesant is going to change all of this 
he's going to turn around this colony and make it the Dutch reform haven that it is supposed to be, in his mind anyway. Now, he gets to be so strict that his bosses in the Amsterdam chamber actually send him letters saying, basically, dude, you need to chill. You're being a little hard on these people, okay? So back off a little bit, and we'll see a couple examples of that coming up. He institutes blue laws so that the Sabbath is properly worshipped and observed. He makes sure that unmarried couples who promise to marry eventually can't live together until you actually get married. As, as we brought up in a previous episode, that was a fairly common practice. Under Stuyvesant, we'll see the real growing of the colony to the point where we have stable ministries that are supported and stable school systems that are built into the ministries that are also supported with tax dollars. Stuyvesant also instituted strict punishments for not observing the Sabbath correctly or causing some sort of disturbance that was inappropriate in church. Now, here's a great example from 1658. Andrew Vrydock was docked six months wages for violating the Sabbath, and he was put on the night guard for six months. What did he do? He got drunk, went to church, and got into a fight. So this both shows you the strictness of Stuyvesant's new rules and the general attitude of the, um, the churchgoers up until this point, that things could get so bad you'll have a drunken fight in church. This was probably more common under directors like Walter Von Twiller, Walter Von Twiller, who uh, himself was quite a lush and could often be bribed with alcohol to not do his job. So now under Stuyvesant, though, laws are going to be followed, decrees are going to be decreed, and things are going to get shut down for people of other religions. Whereas before, it was kind of tolerated, people looked the other way, people didn't weren't even aware because everyone was so spread out. Now the colony's growing rapidly. We're seeing all sorts of different folks come in because Stuyvesant and the Dutch West India Company are not picky about who they accept as colonists because they just need bodies in the colony to block out the uh, those who are uh, pleading an oath to the English and just coming in from the east and now from the south. And in taking in a lot of Germanic peoples, you're going to get Lutherans. Now you would think that Lutheranism would have some level of acceptance in New Netherland. So New Netherland is officially Calvinist, and these incoming Germanic folks are Lutheran, both Protestant denominations, Lutheranism, of course, being the oldest. And to our modern sentiments, they're pretty much the same. They're Protestant denominations, so there's, there's a commonality there. But at this time, there wasn't. And this is where that, the idea that New Netherland was this great tolerant, tolerant place starts to break down. That and the whole bit on slavery we had in our last episode, obviously. So in 1653, the Lutherans, they petition Stuyvesant, and they want to worship openly. They say, hey, we're pretty close to what you got going on. Why don't you just let us do our thing openly? We can have a nice public community together. Stuyvesant right away says no. But he also says, okay, well, I'm going to go have some correspondence with my bosses back in Amsterdam. And, you know, we'll see what they say on the matter. And, of course, the West India Company influenced by the Dutch Reformed Church way back in the Netherlands, said, no, 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 no. No open worshipping of Lutheranism in the colony. So that got shut down both by Stuyvesant and the company back home. But in that same 1654 letter uh, telling Stuyvesant to inform the Lutherans that no public worship of their religion will be allowed, it also said, you know, Stuyvesant, break it to them nicely. Try, try to be diplomatic about this, will ya? We hear you're... Mm, you got a bit of an edge on you when it comes to religious affairs. We understand you're very religious. You're very passionate about it. So are we. Just treat them with respect. But on at least two more occasions, the Lutherans in the colony made a similar request. So 1653, they did again in 1654, and then in 1657. Each time they were denied. Now they had their freedom of conscience, remember, which means they could believe whatever they want inside of their head, but they're not allowed to... Uh, try to spread it around. They're not allowed public celebrations. They're not allowed to build a church to that denomination. They're not allowed to have ministers. But that didn't stop ministers from sneaking in occasionally. And one Lutheran minister, Reverend Gutwater, made his way into the colony in 1659. Stuyvesant and the Dutch Reform minister, Megapolensis, they hated this guy because they kept imprisoning him and then exiling him from the colony. Get out of here. 
and then he'd show up inevitably back into the colony. People were hiding him, and he was being transported at night. He kept showing up again and again. The Lutherans thought that this persistence would pay off in the end. What ended up happening is that finally Stuyvesant put him on a boat and sent him back to the old world, back to the Netherlands. He said, you know, I'm going to put you way over there. If you're going to make your way back here next time, good luck to you because this is as lenient as I'm going to get at this point. And so this is how Stuyvesant and the company and the colony were towards a denomination that today, again, we would consider extremely close to the Dutch Reformed tradition. However, there was another group out there who started to infiltrate slowly, who Stuyvesant could not stand one bit, and the English hated, everybody hated this group of people at the time, because they were the most radical group in the world. And when you hear what this group is, you're going to laugh. It's the Quakers. Nowadays, you think of the Quakers as like, some sort of Amish-like community that existed at one point in time. It's likely today you don't know a Quaker. You know, you think of them as friendly. You think of them as humble and down to earth. You think of them dressing in black clothing and selling breakfast foods to you. Friendly folk. You could not be more wrong on how the rest of the world saw the Quakers at this point in time. So the 1650s, 1660s, the Quakers would be described with words like anarchists, devil worshippers, infested with the spirit of Satan, draft dodgers, tax evaders. So why would this be? What do you actually know about the Quakers of the 17th century? Probably very little. I knew very little at one point in time. I think in college I learned a little bit and I learned a little bit in the last couple years doing the planning for this podcast. Well, this is how they built their reputation. The Quakers believe they essentially have a direct link to God. They don't need formal clergy because they essentially inside of their minds and their hearts and their souls have a cell phone connected right to God. And if God so chooses to talk to you, God can do that directly. They don't need an in-between power. And because of this, you don't need formal clergy. What else don't you need if you have a direct link to the creator and designer and sustainer of the universe? You don't need any sort of government You don't need any sort of religious authority, political authority. You don't need a king. You don't need a parliament. You don't need a prime minister. And this is how they get the reputation for being anarchists. Because at certain times, yeah, they were totally anarchists, believing in no government whatsoever. And so they had no recognition of authority. They were the punks of the 17th century, right? They were dangerous. And that's because if you had a bunch of Quakers living in your country or municipality, You can't draft them. They will not fight in wars. They're pacifists. They're not going to pay taxes. They don't recognize your laws. And those are just the sociopolitical matters. They're they're completely non-compliant. Extremely annoying and dangerous and scary if you're trying to run an area. Because they take converts and they actively look to convert. And so you could, in theory, your entire colony or nation or just your little tiny county could be overrun by Quakers and complete anarchy would take over. You would lose your position and God knows what would happen. They were dangerous. But here is the spiritual matter involved. Since they don't require ministers and God can talk to them directly. If you look in the Bible, there are certain times, especially in the New Testament, after Jesus ascends into heaven, where when God decides to talk to people, they start writhing around and speaking in tongues. Now, the Quakers would start to do this. They would show up in places and start saying things that were nonsensical and just simple vowel sounds over and over again. They were speaking in tongues. And they would be wiggling around, their arms flailing in the air, their eyes going crazy. It was madness. As far as anyone else knew what was going on, they, they said, these people are possessed not by the spirit of God. This is clearly some sort of mania of a demonic spirit. And these people start showing up in New Netherland without any sort of permission or announcement in 1657. A ship arrives in New Amsterdam, docks in the harbor. It has no flag. It did not, it did not salute when it crossed the fort. Stuyvesant came out himself because this is quite unusual for the time. And the captain showed him no sign of respect, didn't take off his hat, nothing to acknowledge his authority. 
Stuyvesant surmised that this was a ship full of Quakers. The dangerous anarchist element he doesn't want or need in the colony. And so he says to them, he's diplomatic, he says, you know, you folks, you could stay the night, but I can see here that you don't recognize our authority, you seem to be Quakers. That's, we just don't want that element in our, in our colony. You wouldn't fit in well here. You can stay the night. In the morning, you gotta leave. In the morning, the ship left. But two women, one named Dorothy and, and another named May, stayed behind. Later that day, in some sort of public display of their connection to God, they were found roving the streets, speaking in tongues, gyrating and wiggling as if dancing to a song that only they could hear. And they were making these horrible, loud noises that no one could recognize. And people were coming out into the streets and they didn't know what was happening. And people thought, you know, uh, is, is there a fire? What's going on? What, what, why, why are there all these moaning, loud noises? They were beginning to kick up a hysteria. At that point, they were arrested. They were put on a boat and they were deported to the colony of Rhode Island, which was an English colony that was considered the sewer of New England because that's where all the religious dissidents ended up. But the Quakers continued to come in in droves. Again, they didn't recognize authority. They were going to keep coming regardless, coming in from the English colony specifically. The historian George Leslie Smith says, No more serious threat could have been posed to New Netherland established order than that posed by the Quakers. Stuyvesant wanted the Quakers out. There was no freedom of conscience for them. You cannot be in the colony. If you are a Quaker, you can't hold it in your head. I don't want you here at all. And so the Quakers were especially popular among the English settlements within New Netherland, who, of course, were loyal to the Netherlands or the Prince of Orange specifically. Stuyvesant issued rewards for outing Quakers. Not only that, but he offered punishments for harboring of Quakers. The English settlements along Long Island, many of them got together and made what was called the Flushing Remonstrance, which basically said, you can't do this to Quakers. You can't do this to any of us. That is against our freedom of conscience, which we were guaranteed way back in 1640. And to this day, that remains a founding document for the principle of religious freedom in this country and on the North American continent. Of course, Stuyvesant ignored this remonstrance. If you were found harboring, harboring a Quaker, you could be fined 50 Flemish pounds. If you bring a ship into harbor and there's Quakers aboard, they'll take your ship and everything in it. And now that's the possessions of the Dutch West India Company. They weren't fooling around when it came to Quakers. So on top of the colony growing by leaps and bounds and all the problems with the official English colonies trying to push their way into New Netherland, we have them over a five, six year period hunting down Quakers and expelling them from the colony. It almost became like an obsession for him. Like if you see the depths he really went to at times, it was quite a lot to get rid of these people who were essentially peaceful, although didn't provide anything for the growth of the colony. I'll give you two examples of when Stuyvesant took it a little too far with the Quakers. One, they sniffed out a Quaker by the name of Robert Hodgkin, and they dragged him from a cart to New Amsterdam. Then they sentenced him to years of hard labor, where he would be beaten at regular intervals. The townspeople would see this poor man being beaten over and over again, and eventually Stuyvesant was moved to just banish the man, and he was sent back to the old world. What ended Stuyvesant's five, six year witch hunt McCarthy trial period of Quakers was when he finally exiled a Quaker by the name of John Brown, who kept showing up and he would give him the same treatment as he gave the last guy. Finally, he exiles the guy back to the Netherlands. The thing is, John Brown back in the Netherlands, he got into the ear of the West India Company. And the Amsterdam Chamber actually changed their tune a little bit. And they wrote back to Stuyvesant and they said, you need to show a maximum of moderation for the Quakers. Treat them like any other religious group who is not Dutch reform. And from that point on, there's Quakers in the colony. And you can just tell that Stuyvesant just can't stand it. But he's got very, impressive, very, very pressing matters coming to a head in 1662, 1663, and so on. Lots of stuff are going to go down 
and we'll hear about that in our next episode. So Stuyvesant is often the hero in our stories, but I've introduced you to some elements about Stuyvesant that I've been holding back, letting you hear slowly. Last episode, we learned he was a slave owner, and he owned up to 40 slaves. Not a good guy, after all. Sometimes he's the hero of the story, but he's kind of like an anti-hero, because he just doesn't fit in with today's world. And now you just learned if he met the Quaker Oats guy, he'd probably beat the guy and then send him packing across the Atlantic. It's not going to get better, folks, because now we're introducing Stuyvesant to the Jewish people. Remember, Stuyvesant doesn't even like other Protestant denominations. You know, he had one Catholic Jesuit come through and there was a celebration and he showed them courtesy and that might have all been a show to maintain peaceful relations with France and New France. But now we're going to deal with the Jewish people coming in. They're not even a Christian religion. So how did the Jewish people end up in New Netherland and in New Amsterdam specifically? It had been a long journey for the Jewish people to make it to the New World. And they were always hoping that there'd be a, a better opportunity for them there. Because back in the old world, the story wasn't very pretty for them. So various places in Europe and other places in the world, the Jewish people were welcomed at certain times and tolerated at certain times. And then almost inevitably, there'd come a turn of xenophobia and they would be pushed out. And so the Jewish people had to get used to being mobile and develop talents that weren't tied to working the land or owning land because you couldn't count on that land being there for you. And this story had been going on since 70 AD with the destruction of the second temple in Jerusalem. And so since any unified community had been broken up so long ago, Jewish communities were scattered all over the known old world, uh, deep inside of parts of Africa, like Ethiopia, for instance, far off in Central Asia and in India. To this day, there's still groups of people who seem to have lost their way a little bit and the Jewish traditions dulled and the, the knowledge of the Torah disappeared. And so today, people are still arguing and debating and researching whether strange little groups in distant corners of the planet actually have some small Jewish ancestry. And on top of that, of course, you have the lost tribes of Israel many, many years before the destruction of the Second Temple. And so the New World was always seen as a fresh start for the Jewish people because the Old World was just so terrible to them. One of these places in the Old World for which they found some safety was on the Iberian Peninsula in Portugal and in what would become the nation state of Spain probably the most successful place for the Jewish community in all of the Middle Ages up until the Inquisition. So before that Inquisition happened, though, the Jewish people settled in quite nicely. They had been there probably since the Roman Empire in some form or another, some amount. And many of them became sailors. Some of them even became pirates. In fact, a man named Fernando de Lorona, a Portuguese Jewish sailor, buccaneer, actually claimed Brazil for the nation of Portugal, and not only opened up the new world for the Portuguese, but specifically opened up a smaller door for Jewish immigration to the new world. And so Brazil had these small Jewish communities along the coast. And of course, as we've learned in this podcast, Brazil is taken over, a portion of it anyway, by the Dutch. Meanwhile, we have the Spanish Inquisition which also trickled into Portugal. And we see the expulsion of the Jewish people from the Iberian Peninsula. We see them taking refuge in Brazil and little colonies in the Caribbean. We also see the Jewish community going to the Netherlands. And unlike the stereotype, the old Netherlands was actually more tolerant of religious differences than New Netherland. So this idea that they escape religious persecution by leaving the old world and coming to the new doesn't apply in the Netherlands. And the Netherlands, the Jewish people had a certain level of rights that were often greater than uh, the Catholics, especially in the city of Amsterdam, where they're actually allowed to build a copy of Solomon's temple, in effect, allowing them to worship openly, which again, there's going to be places where they're not even allowed to live or travel through. And in Amsterdam, they're allowed to publicly be themselves to some level. That being said, there are certain trade guilds that they were not allowed into, public offices they couldn't hold, 
And so this relegated them to certain jobs. But they were allowed to make investments of certain types, including investing in the Dutch West India Company. It would be a hard job of finding a place better in Europe at this time than Amsterdam for the Jewish people. They truly had more freedom and more opportunity, which is something people don't always focus on, but potential upward mobility than anywhere else in Europe. In 1597, Emmanuel Rodriguez Vega was the first Jewish citizen of Amsterdam. He was able to buy his citizenship. And of course, as you could tell by his name, his family or he himself uh, were refugees from the Iberian Peninsula who didn't want him around anymore. Despite this level of tolerance back in Old Netherlands, Peter Stuyvesant, running New Netherland, had very little tolerance for the Jewish people. He had some experience with them before. If you remember, Stuyvesant, as a younger man, had some role in the Dutch West India Company in Brazil. And then he eventually became governor of the ABC Islands in the Caribbean. On Carousel, at one point, this New World Jewish community attempted to set up a colonial settlement of which Stuyvesant would have some oversight. The colony ended up being a miserable failure. And it's because the people in the colony weren't doing the things necessary to grow the colony. Now, these deficits and personality of those particular individuals, Stuyvesant used that to color the Jewish people in general. And so he never liked the Jewish people, especially after this point in time. But Stuyvesant's own prejudices would just lay latent for a while. Until right around 1654, when three Jewish businessmen show up from Old Amsterdam to New Amsterdam. These men were named Jacob Barsimon, Solomon Peterson, and Asser Levy. Now, these guys had some means to them, and there doesn't seem to be too many complaints about them being in the colony, because they could provide for themselves, and they provided services for others. Again, this is New Amsterdam. This is the future New York City. What can you provide for us? What can you do for us? If you can make it here, you'll make it anywhere. I don't, I don't know if Stuyvesant was singing that, but y you get the picture. But then about three weeks later, a ship rolls into New Amsterdam. French flags. And they thought, trading ship? Merchant ship? What is this ship? And as it turns out, the Dutch possessions that they had taken from the Portuguese had been retaken. And the Jewish population there had been expelled by force. Their ship, meaning to go back to Amsterdam, ended up shipwrecked. And at the last minute, the French came and saved them, pulled them out of the water. But the French themselves, staunch Catholics, they were not willing to take these people all the way back to Amsterdam. And they said, you know what? We can take you as far as New Amsterdam. And so 23 unplanned refugees end up in New Amsterdam. Now Stuyvesant, as we have established, not a fan of the Jewish people, but they were inside of the growing Dutch Empire, and so he had some responsibility to take them in. However, he expected the Jews who came a couple weeks ago to support this community. So during this time, as we've seen in past episodes, the, Af the free African community supports itself, the English communities off in Long Island, they support themselves. And so the pre-existing Jewish community, these three businessmen, should support these 23 refugees. However, it is reported that at least one or two of these Jewish merchants from Amsterdam were not terribly helpful to this refugee community. Now, there's a couple reasons for this. First of all, they just showed up themselves. They might not have a lot of means to them. Secondly, they were actually from two different Jewish communities that this divide still exists to this day, and you can read about it at length on your own. The Jewish folk from Amsterdam were Ashkenazi, whereas the refugees were Sephardic. The Ashkenazis being, you know, originally they're all from the same place, but spending some time in Central and Western Europe, eventually finding most of them in Eastern Europe, and then the Sephardic Jews, of course, lived on the Iberian Peninsula and parts of North Africa. And the two communities became distinct and separate from one another. And so there might have been a little bit of ethnic difference between both Jewish groups. And so some people suggest that maybe that's why 
the uh, Jewish merchants weren't very helpful. Also, another thing is there's 23 of them. There's 23 of them. You want three people to support 23 people? Even if you give up everything, you're not going to provide that much. Could you and three people in your family support 23 other people with, with nothing to their name? No. You'll, you'll need more resources. And so over the course of the next year or so, while Stuyvesant was figuring out what to do with this community, they relied on charity from the Christians in New Amsterdam and from the church itself. Today, New York City, in our living memory, has a tradition of being a place for refugees. I mean, think of the Statue of Liberty. Think of what's inscribed upon it. But not so much in the 17th century. If you're a refugee with no means of your own, or, or no plan to set up some sort of productive business, you weren't welcome. Uh, they were taken in, because of course they were Dutch subjects, but Stuyvesant was looking for a way to get rid of them as soon as they showed up. The religious authority, he too wanted the Jews gone. Megapolensis wrote in one of his letters that the Jews are godless rascals. And he also claimed that they had no other aim than to get possession of Christian property. Stuyvesant couldn't agree more. One of the few times we see the religious authority and the worldly authority in New Amsterdam and New Netherland agreeing on something, and it's their mutual hatred of Jewish people. This doesn't sound like tolerance, does it? Again, you're in the wrong century if you're expecting tolerance as you know it. So here's Stuyvesant on the Jewish people. He writes to the Amsterdam chamber that he wants these people gone. And he says that the Jewish people are a deceitful race. And he says such hateful enemies and blasphemers of the name of Christ that they should not be allowed to further infest this colony. Ooh. Does this not put the nail in the coffin for you as to why Stuyvesant is not a modern hero? The company writes back to him and they say, no, the Jewish refugees are allowed to stay in the colony. As it turns out, as I mentioned before, some of the owners of the Dutch West India Company were Jewish. And so they had a little support from back at home. But that same letter did say that the Jewish community must support itself. They must support their own poor and keep to themselves. They were also allowed their freedom of conscience. They can believe whatever they want, but they were told not to have public worship, just like the Lutherans, just like all these other minority religious groups. Stuyvesant must have been beside himself when he received this letter. And he immediately started putting restrictions on the Jewish people that other religious minorities didn't have at all. So he says, you can't go to Fort Orange. Don't even think about going up the Hudson River. It's not going to happen. They called it the North River. He also says, you can't go anywhere near the Delaware River, which they called the South River. He hemmed them in, basically, to the area around New Amsterdam itself. And then he also said, whatever professions you guys take up, they have to be professions that you're allowed to do in Amsterdam. If you're not allowed to do it in Amsterdam, you can't do it in New Amsterdam. And he informs them that only the Reformed religion can be publicly worshipped in New Netherland. And so he forbids them from building their own synagogue. And you would think, well, this seems like enough restrictions. This is, this is the level of restriction, at least as much as he's put upon the Lutherans. And the Reformed English, in their respective cities inside of New Netherlands seem to do whatever they want to do, period. So this should be it right here. Nope, he keeps going. Stuyvesant makes the Jewish people bury their dead outside of the city of New Amsterdam, in their own cemetery. So even in death, there needs to be a separation between Christians and non-Christians. And then inside of the city of New Amsterdam, they weren't allowed to be part of guard duty along Wall Street or the other fortifications. Because Stuyvesant saw them as the other. Although they're Dutch subjects and lived in Dutch colonies and served well there and defended the colonies by force uh, against the Portuguese many times. At the end of the day, Stuyvesant and probably a lot of other people in the colony saw them as the other because they weren't Christian. And their ethnic group was also a religious group, non-Christian in nature, definitely not anywhere near reformed. They were Jewish. So that's why I use the term that you hear often in history or sociology, the concept of us and them, or the concept of the other. These Jewish people living in New Amsterdam, they couldn't be trusted to do a lot of things that normal people inside of the city of New Amsterdam would be trusted to do. 
And that's because they fit in this category of the other. Now, although they're loyal to the Dutch now, their allegiances could switch at any point. At least this is what is going on inside of the Dutch mind. They know that Jewish people have gone country to country. They've heard many conspiracy theories about Jewish people plotting inside of countries on behalf of other countries or the interest of themselves and their ethnic group. And they also know that the Jewish people don't have a country of their own. And so they're not necessarily where they are by choice. And so there's always the sense that, well, if one group in this colony is going to betray all of us, it might be the Jewish population. In reality, they should be thinking more about the English population at this time. They should be thinking about the English quite a bit. But instead, they're worried about Native Americans up in Albany, even though they have uh, treaties and alliances with one another, with the Haudenosaunee and the Mohawk, they still occasionally worry about the Mohawk, and they worry about the Jewish population, however small it is. Because they are, once again, and I won't say it again, the other. And I have more evidence to back up. This was the general idea for this ethnic group inside of New Netherland. This was a, a accepted opinion, so to speak. The Jewish people, instead of having military duties, they instead paid a tax to support the military. They couldn't be trusted in arms or on military endeavors or to, to be reliable when uh, the going gets tough, so to speak. Also, if Jewish people are allowed to fight and defend the colony, then they can petition for citizenship or even burger rights. Because this is a lot of ways, this is, this is a very common way in the ancient world for people to obtain some sort of uh, democratic rights or some sort of individual rights for yourself inside of your city. In ancient Greece, this caused a lot of city-states to, over time, become democratic because large groups of men would be required to defend the colony. They go off as young men, they uh, engage in a couple battles, defend the colony, come back home. Well, you know, I risked my life for this country, so I should be able to vote or, or have various rights related to voting. Very similar thing happened in the United States. We lowered the voting age to 18 sometime after we, you know, started drafting 18 year olds. And the idea is if you can die for the country, you should have some say in how that country is run. I agree with that. That's a, it's a good sentiment. But Stuyvesant wasn't going to give the Jewish people even that chance. He says, you're exempt from any sort of military service. Don't worry about it. Just pay us a tax to help support the military. Another door closing that was Stuyvesant's doing. And another way that he went around what his bosses were telling him to do. By technically allowing them to stay in the inside of the colony but hemming them in and making them uncomfortable to the point where they'd probably want to leave. But in some places, he went too far, even for his bosses back home. At one point, he bans the Jewish population from traveling anywhere beyond New Amsterdam, anywhere beyond basically Manhattan Island, and all of New Netherland, which will go from the tippy top of the capital district of New York State, all the way down to the Delaware River. And he says, you got to stay on this one island. The company overturns that. They overrule Stuyvesant. He also bans them from owning houses. Basically from owning property. They won't be property owners. Which this was a common thing in a lot of different places in Europe for Jewish for the Jewish population over the millennia and a half or so since the destruction of the temple. They would live in places where they weren't allowed to own anything. Uh, any physical land anyway. So they were used to this rule. But the company again overruled it. They said Jewish people can own land. If they have the money, they buy the land outright. Of course, they can own land. So again, this is a rare example where the mother country in the old world was more tolerant than the colonial establishment, which goes against much of our preconceptions. But ultimately, as far as the new world was concerned to the Jewish people, New Netherland was probably the most hospitable of the colonial endeavors that existed after this point. For quite a while, the prospects in New Netherland for the Jewish people were just a little bit better than anywhere else in this hemisphere, essentially. And historians in the past have used this ship full of refugees coming into New York City as a founding myth for the Jewish uh, American experience. 
because it sounds a lot like a later Ellis Island story. You know, it sounds a lot like the inscription on the Statue of Liberty. You, you have your, your tired, your poor, your huddled masses coming into the harbor of what will one day be New York City and taking in this Jewish population. And even once they get there, there are some struggles, but they thrive and grow. But this isn't exactly true in this case. When the English took over the colony, Asser Levy, one of the three Jewish merchants who showed up before the ship of refugees, is the only recorded Jewish person left in the colony. Which means that these refugees eventually made their way back to the Netherlands or elsewhere. They didn't stay and they didn't make up the makeup or they didn't make up the makeup. Silly me. They didn't become the genetic background or seed of the current Jewish community in the United States, which of course is based around the New York City area emanating out from there. Much like the story of Jamestown, which you might remember in the Disney movie Pocahontas, or the Thanksgiving tale of the Mayflower and the Pilgrims. There is a lot of myth mixed in with the historical truth. And in this case, this wonderful story about refugees, well, it, it almost has nothing to do with the later Jewish population of the United States because all of those refugees seemingly left the colony at some point. And so it's another false start. It's another myth. And that's why I like to do this podcast because we, we can really dive into these nice stories and realize that sometimes they're not so nice or sometimes details have been overlooked to connect it to us today. But let's talk about that lone Jewish person. How did he fare in New Amsterdam? Well, he was fairly successful. He was very successful, actually. And at one point, he was so successful, he applied for his burger right in New Amsterdam, which, of course, was denied. And then he appealed it. And the appeal made it all the way up to the Amsterdam Chamber. And the Amsterdam Chamber said, Jewish people, if they meet all the requirements everybody else does, can become a burger in the city of New Amsterdam. And so... In 1657, he was granted his burger right and became the first citizen of New Amsterdam who was Jewish. By 1730, when New Amsterdam is now New York City, they were allowed to build their first synagogue. And so there, there was the beginning of a small Jewish community there that was stable and growing and not planning on going anywhere. And today, the United States of America, greatest country on earth, is home to the largest population of Jewish people. That might surprise you. But believe it or not, Israel actually has less Jewish people than the United States. And if you do a little research, you'll come to find that the largest community of Jewish people in the world, which is right here in the United States, of course, bloomed and blossomed originally, at least, out of the New York City area, former New Amsterdam. These were the seeds laid by the relative tolerance in the New World of the New Netherland colony, despite Peter Stuyvesant, and brave men like Asser Levy, who when told no, would appeal and go higher and not take no for an answer and go back again and try again and be persistent. And so that's a little lesson to all of you. If you're persistent in your own life and secure your own personal liberties and rights, your spiritual descendants in the future might be all the better for it. All right, so where is this tolerance of New Netherland that you've been hearing about in books and you see on plaques and you, you see in museums, this idea that New Netherland was some great haven for all sorts of diversity and all that? As we know by this point, that was largely a myth by our modern definition of tolerance and diversity, where we celebrate the differences we have. Instead, the colony of New Netherland, tolerance simply met its actual definition. I will tolerate your existence. I will tolerate you existing around me without me wanting to kill you or push you off into a land far away from me. So let's talk about those little tiny seeds that are nearly invisible to us today, but back then would have been like big old pumpkin seeds being thrown onto the ground of New Netherland that would foster this beginning of a melting pot or this idea of religious freedom or secularism for the benefit of both the religion and the state. What are those little tiny seeds that people keep bragging about in New Netherland that up to this point seem completely invisible in our narrative now? Well, if you remember, one of those seeds came from New Sweden. And in fact, it was the Swedish effort that would plant this seed 
and not New Netherland. But considering the Swedes gave up the colony with very little resistance, and there was a uh, level of gentlemanly behavior between the colonies, the colony of New Netherland, in the Articles of Capitulation, guaranteed that the former colony of New Sweden, once again part of New Netherland, would enjoy the freedom of their Lutheran religion. So there actually was part of the larger New Netherland in which you could find a official religion, or a publicly practiced religion, other than the Reformed religion. I know I'm saying the word religion a lot, just deal with it. And so, um, yeah, so the Delaware would have open Lutheran worship. Which again, Lutheranism, by our modern standards, is pretty pretty close to Calvinism, but it's the beginning of something there, okay? Because if you go to New England, you don't see anything near that kind of level of tolerance. So New Sweden actually left a legacy of greater uh, religious freedom than New Netherland, but it's inside of New Netherland, so we can take a little bit of that and hand it off. And then those other little sprinkling seeds we see among the English population... Of course, there were reports on Long Island of a cobbler who went out preaching all on his own. He was he was divinely inspired and started preaching the Baptist religion. Now, Stuyvesant shut that guy down really quickly. And that guy would end up being banished from the colony. But in this very same colony, we see references to Mennonite populations. And in fact, the city of Amsterdam, eventually in the portion of the Delaware that they own exclusively, gives a settlement to the Mennonites. So by 1662, there is a settlement of Mennonites on the Delaware River, officially sanctioned. And the poor Mennonites, this was a group being cons constantly pushed out of parts of Central Europe, parts of England. They're constantly being uh, rejected, in a sense, much like the Jewish people. And they're finding a home inside of New Netherland. And then among those sanctioned English settlements inside of New Netherland, there was an awful lot of freedom for the type of reform religion they were bringing in. As early as 1652, we see that New Englanders received their freedom of worship in Newton. And now you may say to yourself, why would Stuyvesant allow this to pass? Why would he allow another variety of the reform religion other than Dutch reform to become uh, sanctioned in any part of his colony? Well, Stuyvesant saw the English and the Dutch religions, the reform versions, as essentially the same, compatible with one another, although preached in different languages. On a theological level, inside of your soul, your heart, your mind, it was the same religion. And I think even today, a lot of people would admit that Stuyvesant had a strain of Puritanism within him, even though he expressed it in his own Dutch variety. But even before Stuyvesant, even the Scottish Presbyterians in the colony, who lived on the very fringes, during Keefe's War, when everyone was huddled up inside of Fort Amsterdam, they were allowed to use the Dutch Reformed Church in the fort to worship. Because Kieft looked over these uh, English-speaking Presbyterians and what they believed, and he came to realize that their religions were in agreement in everything. And that's a quote, in everything. Of course, he said it in Dutch. In everything. Why I keep hammering home these small details is that what is emerging is a tapestry of acceptance for people who speak different languages or who are of different ethnicities. As long as you had the reformed religion in your heart, it didn't matter what language you expressed it in. In fact, Megapolensis, the great reverend of the colony, who we know wasn't a fan of several of these groups, could preach in Dutch, English, and French. And he did so in all three with no qualms about doing it. It didn't matter what language you spoke. It mattered what's in your heart and your soul. And so by going through the religious history of the colony, we've seen the buds of acceptance on several different levels, and then a lot of non-acceptance on many more levels. But there's a beginning there. And that beginning isn't in other colonies, believe it or not. Go up to New France. They're all Catholic. Go find the natives that they show the most favor on. They're all Catholics or Catholic converts. Go to each Puritan colony in New England and ask them about the other Puritan colonies and see how well and how, how highly they think of one another when they believe essentially the identical doctrine. As far as this part of North America is concerned, the beginning of diversity, of acceptance, and in the future, the celebration of diversity and acceptance, it starts in New Netherland. We can expand this out to ethnic groups and language groups 
when the English finally take over the colony, the Dutch are somewhere between 40 and 60% of the population. So there's a chance most of the population of New Netherland, numbering somewhere around 10,000, were not Dutch. Go to New France. Awfully lot of French folks. Go to New England. Awfully lot of English folks. Go to the southern colonies. An awfully lot of English folks and a small minority of enslaved African Americans. That would only get bigger in time with the transatlantic slave trade. So where can we find the smallest grain of the great melting pot that the United States would become? It's in New Netherland. It's also inside of New Sweden, which at this point in our story is a subset of New Netherland. And so, well before the founding of the United States, well before even the English hegemony of the North American continent and the classic 13 colonies, we don't even have the 13 colonies of the American Revolution formed yet. We see inside of a Dutch colony the beginnings of the things we like to pride ourselves on as Americans. Now, don't you get mad at me right now because I didn't take any political point of view. I didn't say whether this, this glorious vision of America is true or not. I just said that the idea of it starts well before the English roll in and create New York and New Jersey. So when some blockhead out there says to you, why are you listening to a podcast about New Netherland? That was just some kind of side thing. It happened, blah, blah, blah. The English took over. Then the real history started. You could say, uh, because of the content of this particular episode and the other ones, no, 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 no. The, the writing was already on the wall. The blueprints were already written up. The modern United States was already in the planning process before the English even rolled in. It's already there. And because you made it this far into this episode, I'll let you know, this is the end of the culture series. I know it was full of all sorts of rants, but I had all these, this extra information that I felt would weigh down the narratives of each individual story inside of an episode. And I thought I'd save it for this little extra part that people could skip over if they're more interested in stories. Whereas you, the listener, because you hear me right now, are more interested in the heavy details in addition to the stories. You get that. But I'm going to let you know right now, it's over. We'll go back to the main story. The rants are finished. 